Well, it's great to see everyone here this evening and uh, looking forward to tonight and getting into the book of Hebrews. I've enjoyed um, the other uh, preachers that have been preaching through the book of Hebrews. Uh, of course, my dad uh, preached through the uh, first few chapters, and then Brother Joel uh, was preaching through the next few. Um, but I have to say, I'm glad that I'm preaching through the next few, all right? And uh, I, I enjoy preaching. I um, no doubt I, I enjoy a break every once in a while, but, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember on Wednesday nights, it was probably, I'm trying to think, was it September? I think maybe September when my dad started through the book of Hebrews, something like that. So it's been a few months uh, on a Wednesday night. So I am, uh, I'm looking forward to this. And so you're stuck with me from here on out for a while, all right? So very good. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 10, Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to be reading verses 1 through 18. 1 through 18. I'm not saying that we're going to get through 1 through 18, but we're going to read through 1 through 18, right? And so Hebrews chapter 10, uh, he says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscious of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had its pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. And so as we're coming to chapter 10, um, man, I'm telling you, Hebrews is, uh, is a very interesting book, as we've already seen these past few months, as uh, my dad has gone through it, Joel's gone through it. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I, I appreciate, um, the way my, my dad goes through things, the way Brother Joel goes through things, the way I go through things, is you'll notice every, each one of us are different, right? Uh, and, and we all have a, a unique way of, of preaching and teaching, and, uh, but it helps to give some different perspective on things. And so as Brother Joel was kind of finishing up chapter number 9, um, and we're moving into chapter number 10, sometimes chapter breaks are hard because we think that there's a break in thought and time, right? So Brother Joel finished chapter 9, and so chapter 10 must begin something different, right? Chapter 10, maybe it's a different thought or it's a different time or whatever, uh, but it's not always that way. Uh, now, sometimes it is, but it's not always that way, and that's why you have to be careful when you come to the end of a chapter and you're getting ready to start maybe an, another one, don't just assume this is something different, right? Remember, chapters are not inspired. Did you know that? The chapters in the Bible are not inspired. Did you know that when uh, the author of the book of Hebrews wrote the book of Hebrews, he did not write chapter one and then stop and be like, okay, this is a good place to stop. Let me write chapter two now. You know that it was not written like that, right? It wasn't until later that they actually put the chapter breaks and the verse numbers and things in there. And so the whole purpose of that is to make it easier to find, find passages, easier to read and things like that, right? So don't just assume that when one chapter stops and another begins, something new is taking place. Because in fact, 
we find that in chapter 10 here, it is a continuation of chapter number 9, right? He's not starting something new. He's actually continuing uh, what we found in chapter number 9 here. And at the end of chapter number 9, we found one main thing was the emphasis, right? I, again, there's, there's lots that, that are going through here. But if we could take the last few verses of chapter number 9, what would we say, does anybody know, what would we say would be the, the emphasis of the end of chapter number 9? Anybody know? It's one word. One word. What's that? What? Once? No? Rob? What's that? Sacrifice? All right, kind of close to that, right? It's blood, right? The, the emphasis at the end of chapter number 9 is the blood, right? Notice back up in verse number 22. What does he say? Without, and almost all things are by law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission of sins. So verse number 22, he says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Verses 23, 23 and 24, that heavenly tabernacle is purified with the blood, right? The blood of Jesus Christ, right? Like the earthly tabernacle was with the blood of animals, right? So just as the, the earthly tabernacle, the priest would take the blood of animals and sprinkle it in uh, the, the tabernacle there, so the Bible tells us that Jesus took his blood and purified the tabernacle. In 25 and 26, um, he tells us that Christ only had to offer his blood once, Right In verse number 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered in the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So he says there was this blood was only offered one time. Right, The blood of Jesus Christ offered one time. In verse number 27, he talks about uh, the appointment of death. That man, every man is appointed to death because of sin. And every man is appointed to judgment after death, right? And of course, this judgment is because of sin. And those that do not know uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, those who do not have the blood of Jesus Christ uh, applied to, to their uh, sins, they are uh, going to be eternally separated from God forever in a place called the lake of fire, right? Uh, of course, we know that that's not God's desire. That's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, right? Uh, verse number 28. So we think about all of this. Um, what, is, what, is ha what is happening here from verses 22 on? It's about the blood and what Jesus Christ has done. And so in verse 28, he says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So because of this appointment of death, and the Bible says every man is appointed to die, right? So because of this appointment of death and judgment that all men will face, what happened? Christ was offered. That's what he says. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, right? Um, and that's what he says. Christ was offered to bear our sins, not just my sins, not just your sins, but the sins of the world. He died for the sins of the world. And that's why anyone, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved, right? So anyone who's willing to put their faith in Christ can be saved, right? Uh, and again, that's just, that's amazing that Jesus Christ would be willing to do that, right? That he would be willing to come for us. Now, to those who accept his payment for their sins, he says in verse number 28 there, that he is coming back for them one day. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So think about this. In the closing verses of chapter 9, there are two things that he joins kind of together, right? He joins these two things together at the end of chapter number 9, right? So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. So we have the cross. Jesus Christ died on the cross. But then notice the second part. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time. So in verse number 9, he joins the cross to the second coming, right? You have the cross and you have the second coming of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, obviously, we know one of those has already happened. And it's not the second coming, right? <laughs> okay? It's the cross. The cross has already taken place. Jesus Christ has died on the cross. And he says, unto those that look for him at second coming, he's coming again right? And so we understand these are, these are two major events that he's speaking about here, right? The cross, 
we're able to have our sins forgiven. And because we are saved, we look for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, for those who have put their faith in Jesus, what comes between the cross and the second coming? What comes between the cross and our entrance into glory? What comes in between that? What comes in between that for you, right? If you say, yes, I know Jesus Christ is my Savior, right? So you're saying you have the cross, right? You've accepted Christ, but Jesus Christ hasn't returned yet. So what is in between the cross and the second coming for you and me? Well, but we've already, we've already accepted Christ when we put our faith in, in, at the cross, right? So that's, that's talking about those who've accepted Christ. But So what is in between the cross for us when we accepted Christ and his second coming? For you, for me, what's in between? What's in between our salvation and his second coming? You're overcomplicating it. What? Life. Between the day that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and the return of Jesus Christ, guess what's in between those two things? Your life right now. Your life right now is in between those two things, right? From the day you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior until the second coming of Jesus Christ, whether that's whether we die and we go to be with the Lord or He returns, your life is in between that. And that's what he's going to begin dealing with here in these closing chapters, right? I mean, he has completely laid the groundwork for salvation and things, okay? I mean, you go through, we've gone through chapters 1 through 9. Um, and, and so what he's going to begin dealing with is our life right now, the Christian life that he wants us to live here on the earth. And this is what is mainly in view in the closing chapters of, of this epistle here, of this letter, okay? Um, how we are to live our life. What way does the Lord want us to live, okay? Um, and so that's what we're going to see as we go through the closing chapters of the book of Hebrews, okay? So in chapter 10, verses 1 through 18, there is, there's one particular theme that he speaks of here from verses 1 through 18, and that is our perfect standing before God. Our perfect standing before God. To be able to stand perfect before God. Understand that as a Christian, as a believer, if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we stand perfect before God. Now, I don't know about you, but I know in this life that I live, I still struggle. I don't know about you, but I know that in this life that I still live, I still have difficulties, and I still sin, and I still do uh, all these type of things that we struggle with in life. So how, how can we say that we stand perfect before God when we know that we struggle, and we still have difficulties, and we still sin, and we do all these different things? How are we able to say that we stand perfect before God? Well, this is what he's going to explain to us here, right? This is what he shows us here, okay? So the first thing he's going to speak about here in the first four verses is an insufficient sacrifice. And this is what, uh, again, Pastor Joel has been going through this through several chapters about how the, the insufficient sacrifice, okay, of the law, the Old Testament, all the sacrifices and things, okay? Uh, but he, he's going to reiterate that here because of, of how important it is for us to understand that in our standing before God, okay? So notice what he says, okay? For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect, okay? Now, I don't, I don't know if you do this in your Bible, if you underline or if you highlight or anything like that, but there are some key words as we're going to be going through this chapter that I would encourage you to underline or to highlight or to mark or something because they're very key words, right? Did you notice he says, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never, that word never there is very important, right? 
never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. So here's, here's what he's saying, right? Those sacrifices, the law, the old system can never make someone perfect. There's n- that no one has ever been made perfect through the law. No one. No one has ever been made perfect through the law, right? Um, and so this is what he said. He's very clear about what he's talking about. Notice at the beginning, for the law, right? So he's very clear. We're talking about the law. We're talking about the Old Testament here, the old system, okay? And he says the law, all the sacrifices and all these things, the rituals that even the Jews did in the Old Testament, the sacrifices and the burnt offerings and the sin offerings and all these different things. He says, the law here, right? It's a shadow of good things to come. He says it's a shadow of good things. Do you understand? Shadows are not real. You understand that? Shadows are not real. Have you ever um, have you ever ever seen a uh, a boxer, right? You know he's practicing whatever. Um, maybe you've ever watched a boxing movie or you've seen a boxer or whatever, and um, you know he's he's in a stance and he's basically all by himself and uh, he's just kind of he's just kind of hitting the air, right? Or sometimes you'll actually see them stand up against the wall. And the reason why they stand up against the wall is they want to be able to see their shadow. My shadow's not being seen here very well, all right? But they want to be able to see their shadow. And they're, they're watching their shadow. And sometimes they'll actually, they'll actually try to, again, it doesn't make sense, they're going to try to beat their shadow. Can you beat your shadow? Can you, act, can you actually be faster than your shadow? Well, you can't be faster because the shadow is just a shadow of you, right? Now, it may not be there one second. Then when you put your hand there, there's a shadow that's there, right? How many of you saw the eclipse on uh, Monday? Monday, right? You'd think I'd remember when it was, right? It's a pretty cool event. Um, You know, before the eclipse... Guess what? There, there was a shadow, right? You could see your shadow. But then when the eclipse happened, the shadows kind of disappeared because there wasn't a lot of light. In fact, it went kind of dark, right? Shadows aren't real. And this is what he's saying. For the law, having a shadow of good things, right? He says that the, a shadow simply shows something. As, as he says, they aren't the actual image. He said it's not the very image of the things. A shadow is, is just... It's showing what is there, but it's not the actual image of it. It's a shadow. It's, it's fake. It's not real. It's not the real thing, okay? And he's saying the law was a shadow of good things that would come after it. Those sacrifices that were offered year after year. What does he say? Look in verse number one. Uh, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually... In other words, every year they offered these sacrifices. Every year they had to come to the temple. And next year they had to come to the temple again and offer the sacrifices. And next year they had to come to the temple again and offer the sacrifices. And next year they had to come to the temple again and offer the sacrifices. Year after year after year after year after year. And how many sins did those sacrifices take away? None. And this is what he's saying. Never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Those sacrifices could not bring salvation. They could not take away any sins. Even If you took all the sacrifices that were ever sacrificed, right? And of course, we understand that the first sacrifice that was made was actually not even made by man. The first sacrifice that was made was made by God. After Adam and Eve sinned, it was God 
that took an innocent animal and shed his blood and sacrificed it. Then he taught Adam and Eve that this is what they were going to have to do. And then Adam and Eve taught their children, Cain and Abel and Seth and all the children, what they were supposed to do. And then we have Cain and Abel. Cain brings a sacrifice of the fruit of the ground. Abel brings a blood sacrifice. God says, Abel, I accept your blood sacrifice. Cain, I reject yours. Why? They were both sacrifices. God says, I'm sorry, Cain, I cannot accept yours because there is no blood. There's no blood. Now again, remember, he says, back in verse number 22 of chapter 9, and almost all things are by law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Now, you say, well, if the blood of those bulls and goats and the animals couldn't take away sin, then what's the point? Why did it make a difference whether they used corn or watermelons or whatever or whether they used a goat? What what makes the difference? The blood. The blood makes the difference. Why? Because this was a shadow The law is a shadow. It's not showing the very image, but it is a shadow. And here's the thing. If, if Cain could have brought his corn, or we don't know what he brought, but if he, I'm just using, if he would have brought his corn or his watermelons or his, you know, potatoes or whatever it was, then the shadow is showing you can bring whatever you want. So now who gets to determine what they bring? Anybody does. Anybody gets to determine what they bring. But God says, Cain, I cannot accept that. Because the shadow must show, there must be the shadow of the very image. And if the very image is going to be the blood, as we just read at the end of verse number 22, it's the blood of Jesus Christ, then the shadow had to show the blood as well. And so even if you took all of the sacrifices from the, from the very first one that God uh, sacrificed all the way through, if you took all of those sacrifices, and you cannot imagine how many sacrifices must have been made. I mean, you can't imagine. I mean, just, just in the dedication of the temple, Solomon offered thousands of sacrifices in one day. So you can't you imagine the, the history of Israel and the continual offering of sacrifices. I mean, the priests were offering sacrifices daily because, again, not everybody was bringing a sacrifice every day, but you have a nation, and every person is bringing a sacrifice sometime that year. So just think about it, right? If you have a nation, we know that when Israel left Egypt and they came into the promised land, there was about two million of them. And you have to offer a sacrifice for every person, for every family. Can you imagine how many sacrifices were done in a year? In just one year? And then as the nation continues to grow, how many sacrifices, more sacrifices there has to be? And so even if you took all of those sacrifices for the thousand or so years that Israel was offering these sacrifices, do you know all of those sacrifices could not even take away one sin? Not even one. This is why he says here, they could never make the comers there unto perfect. Watch verse number two. For then, for then, what is he saying? In other words... Right, If the sacrifices that were offered could make them perfect, then wouldn't the sacrifices have stopped? For then would they not have ceased to be offered? So if the sacrifices could take away sin, you wouldn't have to keep offering sacrifices. If they could, but they didn't. And that's why every year they had to continually offer those. Because once, if, it, if you could, once you were made perfect by the sacrifice, you would never have to offer another one. But yet we know even the high priest, who, if we could say, should have been the most spiritual, 
should have been the most religious, we could say, the most spiritual, had to offer a sacrifice for himself every year. So even the most spiritual one that the nation looked to had to offer a sacrifice every year. So if they don't make you perfect, then why keep offering them? I mean, let's be honest. Think about it, right? You have to bring a sacrifice. Why? Well, so that you can, you know, you, this is what God says to do. You're supposed to bring a sacrifice. There has to be shedding of blood. Is this going to take away my sin? No. But you need to bring a sacrifice. Okay, fine. Bring a sacrifice. Next year, you need to bring a sacrifice again. Wait a minute, I did that last year. Yeah, but see, it didn't take away any sin. So I'm going to bring it again this year. Yeah, you got to bring it again this year. So this year it's going to take away my sin? No, it's not going to take away your sin this year either. Okay, fine. Bring my sacrifice. All right, next year, you got to bring a sacrifice again. Come on, man. What are you telling me? I've done this twice now. You're saying that both of these sacrifices I've offered haven't taken away a single sin? No, nope, they haven't taken away a single sin. And I got to sacrifice again? You got to sacrifice again. And this one's going to take away? No, nope, this one's not going to do it either. What's the point? You ever think that maybe the Jews must have thought, what is the point of this? If not one sacrifice is taking away sin, then what is the point of this? I'm so glad you asked that question. That's such a great question to ask. I can tell you guys are on your A game tonight, right? Look at verse number three. He says, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Because the sacrifice had to be made year after year after year after year. He shows us the purpose was not to take away sin because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. The purpose was to remind them that they were sinners. Every year they would have to bring a sacrifice. Why? Because you need to remember you're a sinner. You need to remember your sin. You need to remember you've broken God's law. You need to remember you are a sinner. Wait a minute. God gave us the law. We're supposed to keep the law. Remember, God, after Israel was received the law from Moses on Mount Sinai, they said, oh, yeah, all that God has said we will do. How long did that last? Not very long. Didn't last very long at all, right? The purpose of the sacrifices, the purpose of the law was not so that they could keep it because they could never keep it. The purpose of the sacrifice was not to take away sin because the sacrifices could not take away sin. The purpose of the law was to show them they were a sinner. The purpose of the law was to help them see, hey, you have broken God's law. God said, don't take God's name in vain. You did that. God said, honor your father and mother. You didn't do that. God said, don't steal. You did do that. God says, don't covet. You did do that. You have broken God's law. And the sacrifice is to remind you that you are a sinner. The sacrifice is to remind you that there is a payment for sin. There's a payment for sin, and the payment for sin is death. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23, or excuse me, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then in chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. You see, the purpose of the sacrifice was not to take away sin. It wasn't going to forgive anyone's sin. It was to remind them every year, you're a sinner. And if you're a sinner, guess what you need? You need a Savior. To remind them every year, hey, just because you're a Jew doesn't mean that just gives you a free pass and you're going to get to heaven. No, no, no. The sacrifice reminded them every year, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. You need a Savior. You need a Savior. You're a sinner. You need a Savior. Look at verse number four. For it is not possible. <laughs> That's pretty simple, right? It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. That's pretty clear. 
He said, it is not the blood of the bulls and the goats and the turtle doves and all the animals that were shed. It is not possible for any of that to take away sin. It is impossible for, those, for that blood to take away any sin. The law, the sacrifices cannot take away anyone's sin. This is why it is insufficient. This is why he says it's a shadow of good things to come, right? It's an insufficient sacrifice. But notice, secondly here, notice the perfect sacrifice. The perfect sacrifice. Look in in verse number five. He says, wherefore. Now, again, you've, you've heard us say this enough. Whenever you see the word wherefore or therefore, what do you do? Find out why it's there, right? What is it there for, right? It's a continuation. We've just read verses one through four. There's an insufficient sacrifice. So he says here in verse number five, wherefore. So because of that, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had, what are those next two words? No pleasure. Remember I said there's some really important words here. No pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Now, It almost seems like he's being a little repetitive here, and he is, and we're going to look through this and see why. But because the law is insufficient, because the law is just a shadow, we need something else. We need the real thing, the real image. We don't want the shadow. We want the real thing, the very image of the shadow. We need the body that is causing the shadow. The body that is causing the shadow. God said that one would come to be the deliverer. That one would be the seed of the woman. From Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15. It would not just be any man, but it would be of the seed of the woman. In other words, this would be God himself made flesh. In other words, no physical man had a part in this. This was of God. God did this, right? And that's why he says in Galatians chapter 4, in verse number 4 and 5, that you ought to turn over there with me in Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter number 4. Galatians chapter 4. Notice what he says in verse number 4. He says, But when the fullness of time was come... God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. You understand what he's saying here? He's saying this is, this is what we're reading here. And, and wherefore he saith, when he cometh into the world, God had promised that one would come that would be the deliverer. And God tells us, Paul says here in Galatians, that that one, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman. That's what we call the virgin birth, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Why? To redeem them that were under the law. Now again, th- folks, think about this. If, the law, if, if somehow we could be made perfect under the law, why did Jesus need to come to redeem us? Because the law could not. The law is insufficient. The things that you and I can do are insufficient. God said, hey, Cain, your sacrifice will not do. It's insufficient. Even the shadow that you're showing is wrong. Now, we understand the the blood of bulls and goats can't take away any sin, but the shadow had to be right at least. There had to be the blood. And he says, Jesus Christ was made of a woman to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. This is what Paul says in in Romans chapter 8, verse number 3 and 4. He says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, 
God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Why? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. He says the law could not do this. It was weak. So God sent his own son to condemn sin. Because we couldn't. God sent his son to be the sacrifice for our sin. Now go back with me to Hebrews here. Because this is so important that we, we get this. In Hebrews chapter 10, he says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, we're talking about Jesus Christ. We understand God sent forth his son. This is God himself, the second person of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Son became flesh. He, he was roped. He did not stop being God, but he became 100% man and 100% God. He was made of woman. He took on flesh, right? He was made like sinful flesh. That's very important. In the likeness of sinful flesh. It never says that he had sinful flesh. In the likeness of it. He had a body just like we did. But guess what? His was perfect. Had no sin. He had not sinned, right? Now watch what he says here. Verse number five. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Now, what, what we're reading here, and we're going to get to this in a moment, but is actually a quote from Psalm chapter 40. So hold your place here in Hebrews and go back with me to Psalm chapter 40. Psalm chapter 40, he is quoting a psalm that David wrote. And David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is prophesying about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And in Psalm chapter 40, notice in verse number 6, what do we find? Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. You see, what, what the psalmist was prophesying about was the one who was going to come. This one who was going to come to be the deliverer, to, to save mankind from their sin. And so here, Hebrews now is quoting back from Psalms. He says, look, he said, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. Look, it's not about the sacrifices. It's not about the offerings. But a body hast thou prepared me. You understand that, that the virgin birth was not just a, a quick thought that God had? Oh, man, man has sinned. I better, you know, I better figure out what to do. You know, and it, it took God like 4,000 years to figure out, okay, maybe I, I guess I'm going to have to send my son, so okay, down you go. No, 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 no. Huh. God knew what he was going to do before man ever even sinned. And this is what he's saying. Hey, God already knew that there was, he was going to prepare a body for his son. He was going to take on flesh. He said, but a body hast thou prepared, prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifice of her sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Now, what's interesting? He says, God had no pleasure in the sacrifices and the burnt offerings. Who told them to bring the burnt offerings and the sacrifices? Not a trick question. Who told them? Who? God. Now, wait a minute. If God told them to bring the sacrifice and the burnt offerings, then why does he say that God had no pleasure in them? He says, I had no pleasure in the burnt offerings and the sacrifices. But it was God that told them to bring the burnt offerings and the sacrifices. So then why would he say, I have no pleasure in them? God was not pleased in the sacrifices of the animals. He was pleased simply in the fact that they obeyed what he said. 
in doing it, but not pleased in the sacrifices themselves to take away sin. The sacrifices could not take away sin. Yes, God told them to do it, and he was pleased in the fact that they obeyed what he said because they were showing the shadow of what was going to come. But he was not pleased in the sacrifices and burnt offerings to take away sin. Do you understand when religion tries to bring something else other than the blood of Jesus Christ, God says, I am not pleased. I'm not pleased. When religion says, hey, if you get baptized, your sins are going to be forgiven, God says, I am not pleased. You, hey, if you're just a good person, you know, God, God will take your good and he'll take your bad. And, and one day, you know, he'll, he'll, and if your good is more, then you'll get to heaven. God is not pleased. Well, if you just join our church and you be a member of our church, you'll go to heaven. God is not pleased. That's what he's saying here. Yes, they offered the sacrifices of the, the bulls and the goats, but he says, I'm not pleased. Those things cannot take away sin. They can't take away sin. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. I come to do thy will. Notice this expression again. This is repeated twice here. Verse number seven and then again in verse number nine. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. It expresses the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ perfectly obeyed the Father. We read those words, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. And we can just speed right on by. But what, what is he actually saying when he says, I come to do thy will, O God? What is Jesus saying? What is he saying when he says, I come to do thy will, O God? I don't think we really understand many times. Go back with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. In Isaiah chapter 53, in Isaiah chapter 53 is a great passage on the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we don't have time to read the whole chapter. It's only 12 verses, but for the sake of time, we're not going to read it all. I would encourage you maybe go back later and read it. But in Isaiah chapter 53, notice in verse number 10. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse number 10. He said, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. When Jesus said, I, Lo, I come to do the will of God. I come to do thy will, O God. I don't think we fully grasp what Jesus Christ is saying. He says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Not pleased and that made him happy to see Jesus suffer. No, 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 that's not what he's talking about. Just as he says the sacrifices that the Israelites did did not please him. He's not saying that he wasn't pleased with their obedience. He wasn't pleased in that it would take away sin. And when it says here it pleased the Lord to bruise him. What does he mean by that? What does he mean? He explains, he hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. You understand, Jesus Christ became the offering for sin. That's what he says in Galatians. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ, when he says, Lo, I come to do the will of God, thy will, O God, he said, I know what I have to do. I know that I'm going to have to bear the sins of the world. I know what's expected. I know what's going to take place. 
When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. You understand, the only sacrifice that God is pleased with to take away sin is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's the only sacrifice that God is pleased with. He's not pleased with the sacrifice of the blood of bulls and goats and anything else because that cannot take away sin. It is only the blood of Jesus Christ and what Jesus did that is able to please the Father. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied, for he shall bear their iniquities. Is it any wonder when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, and he said, Father, if it be possible... Let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but what? But thine be done. Why? Because he said, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Lord, this is the only way that man is going to be able to be redeemed. I come to do thy will. The only way. It's not through a religious system. It's not through religious rituals. It's not through the sacrifices. It's not through a baptism. It's not through a church. He is showing us that it is only through Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. Jesus Christ became that perfect sacrifice. Jesus, and because of what he has done, go back with me to the book of Hebrews here. Again, I would encourage you to read back and go back through Isaiah 53. It's an amazing passage. But notice what he says again. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. God says, I didn't have any pleasure in the sacrifices because they cannot take away sin. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. And watch. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. The shadow was the first. The shadow was the law. But when Jesus Christ came in in bodily form, Jesus Christ came to take away the first. He came away to do away with the shadow. He said, hey, let me tell you something. You don't need to look at the shadow anymore. You got the real thing here. You don't have to look at the shadow. You don't have to look down there anymore. Look look at me. Look at me. Remember what he said to Nicodemus? He speaks of, in John chapter 3, he said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Why? What happened in the wilderness? Brother, Brother Joel talked about this, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, how as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, what did they have to do? To, to be healed from the, the, the bites of the fiery serpents, what did they have to do? Just look. All they had to do was look. He said, if you look at the brass serpent on that pole, you'll be healed. Jesus said, don't look at the shadow. Shadow can't save you. Look to me. Look to the real thing. Look to me, the perfect sacrifice. And this is what he says. Notice in verse number 10. He says, he taketh away, in verse number 9, he taketh away the first that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus abolishes the first in order to establish the second. He gets rid of the shadow so that he can establish the second, so that he can reveal the real thing that is trying to, to be seen. In fact, this is why he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 17, he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but this is interesting what he says, but to fulfill. But to fulfill. Now remember, remember what he said back in, in, verse number, um, uh, in verse number 1. He says, Never can those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. There is no one who has been made perfect. There is no one who has been made righteous through the law. But Jesus was born under the law, not because he was a sinner. He did not have to. The law never showed a single sin to him. Remember, the purpose of the law is to help us to see that we're a sinner. 
The law never showed a sin to Jesus. He was the only one that was able to fulfill the law. You understand? To be able to fulfill the law is not learning the law and then trying to keep it. No, no, no. That's not fulfilling it, right? You know why? We've already broke it. We've already broke it, right? If I've already broke it and then I try to learn how to do it right, I haven't fulfilled it because I've already broke it. Jesus never broke it. Jesus, the law never showed any sin to Jesus, which is why he could fulfill the law. It did not make him perfect. He was already perfect. Jesus was already perfect. He didn't have to keep the law to be able to be perfect. He was perfect, and because he was perfect, he was able to fulfill it. He kept it all so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And this is why he says the only way to truly put away the first is to be able to fulfill it. And Jesus was the only one to fulfill it. He not only fulfilled the first in living a perfect sinless life, but also by being the sacrifice that was needed to actually take away sin. He fulfilled the law and became the sacrifice to take away sin. This is why Jesus had to come. And we find all throughout the Bible, notice it says there, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Do you understand that Jesus is the, the central theme of the Bible? It's all about him. If, you, if you're reading our, uh, um, uh, our, our daily reading for the church, I think we're in Luke chapter 24, and he talks about how he, uh, Jesus, when he was walking with the, the two uh, on the road to Emmaus, he, he went through and he went back all through from Moses to the prophets and he was teaching them all about who? Him. Jesus. That's what he was doing. The, the Bible is all about him. That's why he says, in the volume of the book it is written of me that he would come and that he would do the will of God completely, perfectly, so that he and only he could be the sacrifice that pleased the Father. He, Jesus, takes away the first, the shadow, that he can be the real one, that he can establish the second. And this is why he says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. And again, here's some really key words here. Notice those last three words. Once for all. Once for all. Jesus Christ offered himself as a sacrifice one time. This is why the father said of his son, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Why? Because he said, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Jesus Christ did everything the father asked of him to do perfectly. He fulfilled the law he fulfilled the Father's will. He became the sacrifice for our sin. By his obedience to the Father's will, we are sanctified through his sacrifice. Not through the church, not through a religious system, not through rituals, but through Jesus Christ and him alone. Once for all. Never again. We don't have to, the law, hey, the laws, he, he fulfilled it. The law is the shadow. We've got the real thing now. We've got Jesus Christ, his sacrifice that was shed for us. And that's how now we can know that we are sanctified through his sacrifice because his sacrifice was the only one that could please the Father. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? And this is, this is why he's going through this, and, and this is where he, we're going to continue on through this chapter. And again, because of what Jesus Christ did, if we have accepted Christ as our Savior, we can stand before God perfect. Oh, am I going to sin next week? I hope not, but probably. Am I going to sin next year? Most likely. So how can I stand before God perfect? Perfect. Because of his sacrifice. Because his blood is enough to wash away all my sin. 
not just past sins, but past, present, and future sins. So I can stand before God perfect, not in my righteousness, but in His. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God for that. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. And Lord, I pray You'd help us. Lord, as, as we we're going through Hebrews, just to truly grasp what You did for us on the cross in obedience to the Father's will that we might be saved. And so, Father, I pray to you, just, uh, Lord, just help us in this, to truly look to you, um, Lord, to truly get our salvation settled, that it's not in a ritual, it's not in a church, it's not in what we can do, but it is only in Jesus Christ and Him alone that we can be saved and nothing else. So, Father, I pray you'd help us, uh, Lord, just uh, even throughout this week, Lord, help us to look to you, And because of what you've done for us, Lord, help us to desire to live for you and to do your will in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, in just a moment, we're going to be dismissed to go over.